auch noch einige da geblieben sind. Wir machen gleich weiter mit dem nächsten Programmpunkt und zwar der Session ähm, Mobile Activism in Africa. Durch das Programm führen und euch auch eine kleine Einleitung geben wird euch meine liebe Kollegin Geraldine Bastier ähm, von New Thinking. Bitte schön. Dankeschön. Hello everybody. Okay, to start with, I'd like to all ask you all to take a moment and think of a product with a label made in Africa. What comes to mind? Cotton? Cocoa? Certainly, until recently, technological innovations were not amongst the most obvious choices. Speaking in terms of development organizations, donor agencies, in fact, Technological development largely relied on the pattern of producing technology in the West and deploying it in the South. Today, I would like to argue that that paradigm is beginning to change. And in this session, I would like to take a closer look at how the spread of mobile technologies and open source technologies has enabled the innovative creation of um, technological applications and, in fact, campaigning methods in Africa. And we've invited two speakers to give their inputs for us today. I'd like you to welcome Sakari Akin, our first speaker. She's many fantastic things. Amongst others, she's a blogger, and she writes one of the most read blogs written by a woman in Africa called Black Looks, and has also edited a book called SMEP's Uprising, Mobile Activism in Africa, which she will be telling us more about today. Our second speaker, speaker, Victor Miklovic, from Uganda, is a member of the Ushahidi development team and will be telling us more about their newest development called Swift River. So for the first input, please welcome Sakari. Thanks. Um, thanks, everybody. And as Geraldine has said, there's some pretty good things that are taking place in Africa today. But in actual reality, there's been good things taking place in Africa for decades. It's just that the mainstream corporate media has chosen to tell a single story, which is usually about poverty, famine, wars, and conflict, and so on. It's not that those things aren't taking place today. They are. But today we have mobile phones, we have bloggers, and so on. So we also have many different stories to tell. When I was growing up in Nigeria in the 60s and 70s, when maybe a lot of you weren't even around, we had landlines. My parents had a landline, and their friends had landlines. And okay, access to the landlines was pretty much only in the hands of maybe 10% of the professional civil service class, but nonetheless, we had landlines. Somewhere towards the end of the 70s, early 80s, I'm not sure what quite happened in Nigeria, but landlines disappeared. And there was a moment when nobody could communicate at all unless you had a car or, or a bus and, or you sent somebody on a message. But now millions of us have mobile phones and it's no doubt that they have transformed people's lives and enabled communication where previously there was none. People and organizations across the continent Signing are using their mobiles are using their mobiles for mobilizing, advocacy, campaigns, social networking, citizens' journalism, crowdsourcing, and research. Nonetheless, we need to think about mobile fo um, SMS messages and, and phones in general. They're, they're not always the most effective technology. For example, if you're in a crisis situation, making a, to, uh, writing an SMS is not appropriate it would be much quicker for you to make a voice call. In other circumstances, more traditional methods of communica communication would be more appropriate. What I want to do is first give a brief look at cell phone use in Africa and some of the obstacles to diffusion. And secondly, discuss a few examples from SMS uprising and elsewhere uh, of how phones are being used and some of the problems around their usage. The African telecoms landscape, there's approximately going on to 1 billion people in Africa today. And out of that, there's between 300 to 400 cell phone subscribers, roughly about 30 to 
However, if you look at these figures much closely, you find that there's quite a disparity within and between countries. So you have countries like Nigeria, South Africa, Uganda, Kenya, with over 50% subscriber rate, compared to countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, Gabon, that have between 1.6 and 6% subscriber rate. Some of the other um, obstacles to diffusion are connectivity, power supplies, cost of handsets, cost of airtime, and issues around poverty, such as um, language and literacy. If you take a country like Nigeria, we have over 300 distinct languages. That's not dialects, but languages. If you added dialects into the equation, you can see how complex and what a challenge that language is. And of course, literacy, which is mainly um, applies to women, particularly in rural areas, is also a problem. Another thing worth noting is that the subscriber rate, which I've said is between 300 and 50, 450 million, is not the same as ownership or usage. For example, some people have three, four, maybe even five phones, while others share one phone between many. And then, of course, there are kiosks, mobile kiosks, which service hundreds of people. So what differences are mobile phones actually making to life in Africa? There's been a great deal of hype from the media, from technophiles and the development industry, which in my opinion is largely exaggerated and exaggerates the number and range of projects in Africa and presents mobile technology as a singular driving force behind social and political change. However, in my own research in compiling SMS Uprising, I came to consider a number of questions around the use of mobile phones. For example, how much have activists really been able to affect progressive change using their mobiles? Is access to mobiles and using it for social change really more than a drop in the ocean? Where people are using the technology, are these changes really sustainable? Are people being um, turned from being citizens into mass consumers, as in the West? And to wh whose advantage is that? And for me, the most important one is to what extent are these projects and innovations breaking down traditional barriers in terms of patriarchy, uh, gender, gender hierarchies, and um, capitalist systems? Or are they creating new hierarchies and sites of power? A digital divide between those haves that have access to aid and funding and the have-nots that don't have access to aid and funding. Another concern I have is the lack of critical evaluation of some of the projects. In reality, there are pockets of high take-up, and this is growing, but there are areas in, on the continent where mobile still remain silent, and in other parts where they're just burring in the background. To pick up my, up, upon my second point, in the brief case studies I'm just going to mention, I want to look more critically at how mobile phones are being used. One of the contributors to the book, I think he's here, but I'm not sure, Christian Cruz, um, identified three broad overlapping trends in mobile usage on the continent. Participation through citizens' media, local innovations around advocacy, and mobiles as a tool for monitoring and transparency. Starting with citizens' media, that's mobiles being used for broadcasting and publishing, there's two really exciting projects that I'm just going to mention briefly. The first one is called the Voices of Africa project, which is a mobile reporter project which enables citizens journalists to send articles, audio and video reports via their mobiles, which are then upload, uploaded to the Voices of Africa website. Voices of Africa started in 2007 in just four countries, and three years later, their coverage is practically throughout the continent, though the coverage is not the same in all countries. Although Voices of Africa is very male-dominated, it has definitely created new opportunities for African journalists, enabling them to tell their localized stories, and which can be reached well beyond their national bound borders. However, one of the problems with this project is it requires a huge amount of funding, including equipment and training, and it's difficult to see how this could re be re replicated at grassroots level. 
One technology that can address this problem is the Freedom Phone, which was developed in Zimbabwe by an organization called Kubatana Trust. Freedom Phone brings together mobile technology with citizen-style community radio and enables anyone to create and broadcast their own content. Broadcasts are simply recorded on MP3 and WAV files, which are stored in a database and accessed through interactive voice response through either SMS messages, a voice call, or a ringback call. Voices like Voices of Africa, the Freedom Phone, is especially useful because it's especially important because it enables us to circumvent mainstream media and government control media, which is important in countries like Zimbabwe and, and conflict areas such as the DRC. Although it's fairly easy to use and set up, I do, after trying it out myself, I still feel that it needs some kind of training. And again, funding is an issue, as is power supplies. Another problem which has occurred in some parts of the continent is like other SMS usage, the Freedom Phone could be used to spread hate and fear. And this has happened in Kenya and more recently this year in Nigeria and in Ghana. The second trend is local innovations around advocacy, which is probably the largest and covers mobilizing and organizing and information and service provision. Here I'll talk about two gendered projects, one from Uganda and one from South Africa. WOGNET, the Women of Uganda Network, has been at the forefront of developing ICT programs for women in Uganda, including mobiles for advocacy, campaigning, information sharing, and provision. One of the main advocacy and campaign programs has been around gendered violence. They use SMS to mobilize women to attend demonstrations to protest against domestic violence and have also taken part in the annual um, campaign against violence against women, which takes place across the continent. In these, both these campaigns, they've integrated SMS with radio and the internet. However, campaigns such as these raise questions about how we define and evaluate success and whether we should actually be defining, be evaluating the success of these kind of campaigns. It's difficult to obtain the accurate figures of the numbers who participate, and maybe we don't, maybe that's not so important, I don't know. Um, but in my view, even if a few women and men have benefited in some way from these campaigns, then I think they're both wor they're worthwhile. As well as sharing rights-based information, Wognet has also integrated radio, SMS, and video in a number of e-agricultural schemes, which help women farmers to access information on, providing, on improving their produce, their soil management, and so on. There's no doubt about the benefit to women of these programs, but how much have they led to gender equality or challenged local patriarchies and traditions? One way of addressing this would be to run the service provision alongside, alongside gender sensitizing programs and building a commun community support networks. Whilst the WOGNET schemes are mainly about capacity building and information provision, the Umyango project, which was run in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, was an interventionist scheme for rural women and men. The project had four aims, to encourage women to report domestic violence, political tensions, and issues around land rights and inheritance, and it also had a human rights capacity building program. The Umyango project was fraught with many problems, not least of all because it was interventionist rather than demand driven. But what they found out is that women were not prepared to use their phones to make phone calls or SMS to report incidents of violence, whether it was domestic violence or to do with land rights or political tensions. They were, they were quite happy to receive human rights information but not make the reports. Another problem with the Umyango pro project was sustainability. They found that having an SMS campaign was, hugely, was a huge obstacle and they couldn't get enough sufficient funding to run the project on a long-term basis. And if you can't run it on a long-term basis, then maybe it shouldn't have started in the first place. A better idea would have been to provide counseling services for men and women in the community 
in collaboration with all members of the community, that's including the chiefs, um, the elders, and so on, and use the SMS as a complement rather than as the central part of the project. The people behind Umyango have now created a new, a new project called the Indiba Africa Mobi, which is a social networking site in English and Isuzulu, specifically for poor rural communities using their cell phones, the same communities that were in the Umyango project. Here, ordinary citizens from, from these rural communities can upload and download information on human rights, jobs, stories, whatever they want. Um, this project has actually only been on board a few months, so it'll be interesting to see how it progresses. The third and last trend is mobiles as a tool for monitoring and transparency, such as campaigns, research, and election monitoring. The first SMS campaign in Africa was actually held by Fahamu back in 2004 to ratify the Protocol on Women's Rights in Africa. Fahamu, who published uh, SMS Uprising, ran the campaign on their website and also set up a phone number in South Africa where people could text in the word petition plus their name and phone numbers if they supported the ratification. Out of 4,000 signatures, they got 500 SMS messages, and at the time, from 29 countries, and at the time, there was a subscriber rate of 50 million. So, was this project, was this campaign a success? Obviously, if you look at the numbers, it wasn't a success. 500 out of 4,000 and 500 out of uh, uh, population, um, subscribers of 50 million isn't very much. However, if you look at the outcome, which was to ratify the protocol, then obviously it was um, a success. One of the first mobile uses of mobile phones for elections was organized by the network of mobile election monitors in Nigeria in the 2007 presidential elections. Volunteers were dispersed across the country and some 10,000 messages were received during the 24-hour election period. More recently, February this year, a team of monitors in Anambra State, which is in the east of the country, also set up a monitoring um, project in which they use four Twitter accounts, which were then aggregated to one Twitter account, and they, 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 they published that on, on, on their Twitter. They also used an SMS bulk, servicing, bulk messaging service where volunteers could text in information. I spoke to one of the organizers, and he said that although overall the project, the monitoring was a, su a success, one of the difficulties they had was in maintaining um, volunteers. At the time of the Anambra state elections, the Nigerian government had deployed 20,000 armed police. And the police in Nigeria are known to be, well, like most police, to, to be particularly hostile and brutal. And many of the volunteers dropped out or were afraid not just to, to, to take photos and video um, content uh, material, but also to actually even text. This clearly contradicts the 2007 monitoring um, project, which, as far as I, I know, did not report any, any problems with volunteers or incidents of violence from political gangs or from the police. In concluding, there's one point I want to make, and one which is very rarely discussed in this context. One of the projects discussed in the book is the Kalunda Child Soldiers Project, which is based in the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, and describes the monitoring of human rights abuses against children, including ex-child soldiers. The region is a, highly, is a conflict zone and compounded by power cuts, insufficient access to airtime, and, and, and poverty. So this in, in itself makes any SMS project not necessarily practical. It's also ironic to me that one of the primary components in which mobile, for, which, uh, which components of mobiles are being used to report human rights abuses in a, in a region where Colton, one of the, 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 the components, is mined and, and has contributed to the conflict in the DRC including the recruitment of child soldiers, sexual abuse of children and women. The cost to people's lives of mining 
of coltan and other minerals in the DRC is particularly high. It's a highly contested militarized zone where people work in slave-like conditions. Women and children are raped and, and, and murdered. Whilst we can't turn the clock back, and we shouldn't necessarily turn the clock back, I think that like other campaigns, such as the Fair Trade campaign, I um, can't think of any, any other one, but I think about all the people here that use technology, that talk about technology, look for new ways to use the technology, and there's more and more um, technology coming out every day. I think about all that, but I wonder whether we think about what happens in the source, where all this technology is sourced, what happens, to, how is it produced, who is producing it, and what kind of um, quality of life do those people have? So I think one of the challenges, one of the things that I would like to see from the people here at this conference, who are, I mean, experts, people with a great deal of knowledge, a great deal of influence and so on, is to think about how some campaign can be started whereby pressure is put on those people that the, the, the manufacturers of the technology can put pressure and to improve the working conditions um, and also possibly influence the, the conflict in the Congo at this time. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sakari. Do you want to join me? And we'll, have, we'll welcome um, Victor for his presentation. And then we're going to have about 20 minutes um, for questions. So get ready. Good evening. Uh, I'll be giving a talk on Ushahidi and Swift River. My name is Viktor Miklovic. I'm a software engineer and developer with Ushahidi. Uh, my expertise is in machine learning and applied mathematics within what we are working on. So what is Usha, uh, Ushahidi? So we are the people who try to provide a platform uh, where people in plight or people who are under a certain crisis or a crisis situation can easily communicate. Now these are snapshots uh, taken in Haiti recently. Uh, this is um, probably Chile. Uh, this is a bombing in Mumbai. Uh, this is the violence in Kenya. Uh, you can see how terrible things are sometimes. Uh, I'll be talking about three main things here. History, the present, and uh, the future. The history of Ushahidi. Ushahidi was founded uh, during the uh, violence in 2007 in Kenya uh, by three people, a lawyer and uh, one of, uh, he calls himself a white African. He's called Eric Hansman. So we also deal in what we call crowdsourcing, trying to get information from people, yeah? Uh, this is a marine just overlooking the chaos within the Haiti civilian population. So what now? What are we forced to do? Ushahidi recently embarked on developing a platform known as Swift River uh, due to the faults which we are going to look at now. Um, we usually provide mapping features. There will probably be someone talking about maptivism in the next days, so you'll learn about things like how to plot uh, areas which have, say, a hidden bomb or areas which are under chaos. And most of this information can be uploaded and also downloaded from within PDAs, mobile phones, and any other device. So, Ushahidi was developed to map reports of violence. Um, not only mapping is, is supported, but uh, people usually could embed a microblog. The microblog could be a text, it could be a Twitter update, a status. Um, 
This is a deployment of Ushahidi in, by Al Jazeera on the wall on Gaza. Uh, this is what's happening in uh, the DRC, Congo. There are certain elections and those people tend to get quite violent and uh, in order to disseminate information to both journalists and any other users, uh, this tends to come up. Uh, we also design mobile applications, Android by Google. Uh, that's a, a phone for the Nokia, since Nokia is very prevalent in African nations or developing countries. Uh, so this is what we have done with SMS. Uh, usually, the users that you can see under number one there are given a public uh, phone, phone number. So they'll usually start sending, it's like sending a tweet. And most of the phones aren't so complicated or very advanced in Africa. So we look for a common denominator, and which is SMS, which can be supported for both 2G and 3G mobile phones. Um, the technology is very, very basic. Uh, they just have to send texts. Uh, everything is uploaded to Ushahidi uh, via frontline SMS. Uh, sadly, we may not have a talk on frontline SMS. Um, reports are passed or are read by volunteers from all over the world or by volunteers who develop websites that are based uh, on Ushahidi. Uh, so our main problem is that everything is done manually by people. I'll be introducing our new product, but first I think I'll have to cover up um, the importance of sharing of data, open data. This is about the Haiti earthquake. In the first few hours we had about 20,000 reports coming in, and in the following days, they are averaging at around 100,000 reports. Most of them were in Creole. Creole is the common language uh, in Haiti. Of course, there are a few uh, foreign pieces of text, probably by journalists from CNN or Al Jazeera, reporting on Haiti and, who, and the people who are on ground. So we have different kinds of texts coming in. We call them reports. They could be Twitter messages. Uh, they could be email, they could be just web blogs, and each report must be verified by a human being, a person. So this is just a continuation of uh, our kind of work, helping relay messages like these. Uh, this is a room within the Tufts University building, and that's in the USA, where in a couple of hours after the Haiti uh, earthquake, a few volunteers sat down and started sifting through uh, many, many pieces of texts, uh, Twitters and all. It was mostly to help uh, family within the US kind of uh, put a, uh, get to terms with what was happening on ground in Haiti. So most of these guys verified reports, they read this. They had to, cause Twitter is designed in a way that uh, anything comes up. So we usually like looking through the search trends within a Twitter or within the Twitter framework. But mo most of all, the d stuff there is so mixed. Yeah, it tends to get dirty and we can't really find or extract information from there. So our big question is how do we separate the signal from the noise? Signal is a term we get from engineering whereby uh, the noise could be analog, it could be sound here and probably patches or echoes coming in. So we're trying, we're trying to get out the importance. I managed to get a small quote from German, separating the wheat from the chaff, which you can read down there, since I don't have an accent. Okay, so we're looking at having a fast response, and in many cases it's just an oxymoron, uh, which just means that we don't really get there fast. Uh, most of the reports could probably have a time lag, could come in like in two hours. So fast response is something we're trying to achieve much faster by listening to the people on the ground. Rather than waiting for CNN to send in a, a crew, we can easily start receiving reports from there. 
So there's always someone first, the person on ground, the injured person, someone who's witnessing some big corruption, scam, or things like that. So these are our three questions now. What if we listen to the crowd? What if we listen to the people? What if we also listen to the victims within that crowd? Our next problem becomes, who do we trust in that crowd? Who do we listen to in the crowd? Um, mathematicians, engineers, and a few people love explaining stuff with graphs. So uh, this one takes us to a few different cases away from Haiti and Kenya. Uh, those are the tweets from a hotel bombing. You can see that in the initial days, there's nothing on that country. There's nothing. Uh, the topmost graph is something that happened during the Mumbai bombings. There's literally nothing before the bombings on that particular report or country. And you can see a surge of data coming up during the next day. Yeah? The same with down there. So I usually like explaining uh, Twitter using graph theory, some more mathematical terms. And everything there that comes out like um, a stick refers to a connection, a relationship. Everyone has Twitter followers. They, they are probably following Twitters and all that. In other words, we are sharing information. So sometimes the graphs get complicated and nasty. And um, I'll be talking about how do you manage this kind of data. Uh, many platforms have been developed for handling and aggregation of, uh, aggregating data. To aggregate data means to put it in one place. And uh, you've probably used TweetDeck, and you can see how things are ag aggregated or plotted as columns. Uh, we see people designing web applications like TweetLinks, um, too popular, tweet URL, everything trying to sum up or summarize everything that's happening on Twitter. I'm using a Twitter example, but the, uh, it also gets to, it tends to become far more nastier when you're using text messaging because people have different ways of communication when using text. Uh, these are far more re refined examples like NetVibes where you have streams from your Flickr account, from YouTube, from some blog you're looking at, we call them RSS feeds, from Twitter. And this is a common example for the Mac users, TweetDeck. So our solution to handling of this data, which is so noisy and so dirty, is to use Swift. Now, Swift is a product we have been working on for the past two months. Uh, it will involve lots of machine learning, a few advances in computing. So what Swift River is, is that we shall be having reports coming in from all over, and Swift River will just have to filter it out. Uh, you can see some robotic images. Uh, that just means we are implementing things using machine or machine learning or artificial intelligence. And the top part there means that uh, we are using the crowd to, do, to help us filter out the data and to also contribute and generate the data. This data could be blogs, they could be tweets, and anything like that. So this is just a quick overview of the filtering process. Uh, this crowdsourced information going through the filter. And you can see we have scattered noise and a bit of information. Then from the filter, we have refined results coming out. And finally, we have weighted every kind of result. We have given it value. We have verified the results. So Swift is an aggregator with entity extraction. I'm sorry for using extreme terms. Uh, I've already explained aggregator to sum up things or put them in one place. Now, entity extraction will probably refer to picking up uh, the cream of your information within a, bit of, uh, a piece of text. For example, uh, we shall see how this shows up in the next slide. 
uh, take a look at uh, CNN. You're, you've searched CNN for Obama, and uh, the highlighted bits mean we're looking for particular important pieces of that text. So in this case, uh, those three words summarize what that article is talking about. And in that way, you'll probably either be more interested in reading that whole uh, newscast or just getting rid of it. So Swift can help determine the authority of your text, of your tweets, of your reports using algorithms. So our goals are to save time by removing the noise from your data, uh, to identify and rate trusted sources, and to help surprise noise. Uh, we also want to help curate. Curation just means to clean up. Uh, usually when tobacco is being made uh, or processed, they kind of remove the bad toxins and all that. Although it's still toxifying, but yeah, that's what happens. Uh, I'll be showing a video now. It's about four minutes. You could, I could make it faster. You have four minutes. It's four minutes? Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, this should summarize everything about our new product. If you have questions, I'll be handling a workshop on Friday. Yeah. Getting started with Swift River. During the recent Haiti earthquakes, Ushahidi, which maps reports of incident during emergencies, was overwhelmed with data. Tens of thousands of reports came in from Twitter, email, blogs, and the web, each report needing to be verified by humans. We were swimming in a river of information, clumsily and inefficiently. A number of tools are great at displaying large amounts of data, but they aren't so great at limiting how much info there is to look through. What if we listen to the crowd? And what if the crowd was the filter? Our problem then becomes, who in the crowd do we listen to? Well, using a number of core technologies, Swift can do this. Swift River is the filter. By scoring and rating the accuracy of incoming content, users can refine how they view results. Let's take a look. Here we have the Swift landing page. On the left, we have incoming data. To the right, we have our channel filter and our veracity slider. Don't worry if your instance has an empty data panel. This is because we haven't added any feeds yet. To start, log in. The default username is admin, and the default password is also admin. After logging in, we're taken to the admin panel. Here we have a graph to the left and our quick stats to the right. In this version of Swift, a number of these options are disabled or have no effect, so let's take a look at the functioning ones. Select the option for feeds. When you click here, you're taken to a panel where you can add various types of feeds. Twitter accounts, blogs, email, phone numbers for SMS, and more. These are the native data types Swift can handle. For Twitter accounts, just enter the user's name. For blogs and other websites, enter the URL of the feed itself. SMS and email take some additional configuration that we won't cover here. Adding feeds here results in their showing up on the main page. If you check the box to the right of the input field, you're trusting that feed and giving it a higher authority than others. This means that by default, it has a veracity score of 100%. Now let's click on settings. This is where administrators control most of the functions of the site. Your site name, tagline, language, default email address, and other options are displayed here. You can also control the number of items displayed per page. You can turn user submissions on or off, and more importantly, you can pair with Ushahidi. Entering the URL of a Ushahidi instance here automatically sends the submitted content in Swift to Ushahidi, pre-verified. For heavy users of Ushahidi, you might immediately see the benefit of not having to verify reports twice. This allows our human curators, we call them sweepers, to use the two platforms synonymously. Now let's go back to our landing page again to cover a few more details. First, the veracity slider allows you to filter content based on score. If you don't want to see content that's predicted to be less than 60% accurate, just set your slider as such and click Submit. Doing this allows you to focus on the sources you trust while removing anything that doesn't qualify. Finally, let's take a closer look at the individual feed items. 
The red submission box to the left is the trust button. Clicking it tells Swift that the attached content is accurate and it improves the source's score. If the content is inaccurate, noise, or cross chatter, you would instead click the red button with the X to the right. That button decreases the score of the source and removes the item from view. Clicking the newspaper icon next to this button takes you to the original content itself. You may have noticed an area that says tag. This is for adding contextual information to the content to help with sorting. On the item at the top, I've added the tags Kenya, e-commerce, and business because the Twitter user's message is about those things. Clicking the X removes those tags. In future builds, these tags will be auto-populated by Silk, the Swift language computation core. Users are rated, content is rated. The result is a system that sorts data by accuracy and earned authority as opposed to popularity. Swift makes it easier to wade through vast rivers of information. And now, hopefully you have a better understanding of Swift River. Thank you, that will be all for today. Thank you, I'll Victor. be moving into the panel. Do come and join us. And as you mentioned yourself, thank you. <laughs> as you mentioned yourself, um, you'll be holding a workshop tomorrow to explain in more detail how Swift River functions, and especially for all those really in-depth technological questions. I think that's a good place to go tomorrow. And Sakari, you also touched on so many very critical and very interesting issues in your talk. And um, Sakari will also be holding a workshop tomorrow on the topic of political blogging in Africa. And in case we don't get to deal with the bandwidth of those today, we can pick them back up tomorrow. And the third session I'd like to point out for further attention is Maptivism by Christian Kreutz, as you mentioned too. That's also taking place, and none of these overlap, so you can see them all, which is fantastic. Okay, um, we have a few more minutes left, about 10, 15 minutes to answer questions. If you have questions, please do come forth. Um, I do want to start by asking you, uh, Victor, you said Ushahidi was originally developed. Uh, the idea came from Kenya after the outbreak of violence, elections 2007, 2008. Um, how did you first become involved as a programmer, and what is your programming community set up? Uh, where do the people come from? How do you work together? Well, Ushahidi started in 2007, late 2007. I got involved in Ushahidi, with Ushahidi late 2009, so that's two years down the road. Um, Ushahidi is a very diverse open source community, um, and with every open source project, usually have the ringleaders. So there are roughly about 20, 25 of them uh, that guide the direction that many other open source developers come in and join. Yeah. Now you can say that Swift River is a new tool, a new innovation, but it's connected to Shahidi. How do you think the fact that these these tools, these applications like Frontline SMS and Shahidi are built with open source technology, um, how does that contribute? Well, open source is quite cheap, and um, Swift River is something that will help enhance Ushahidi um, using some very, very common technologies. Uh, we are just adding a new thing, feature known as natural language processing, uh, which will help automate feeds, because during a crisis, you need to have verified and fast real-time data. And in our case, we are delayed by several hours. We want to make things quite faster than that. Yeah. And I know uh, that next year, elections are due to take place in both Uganda and Nigeria. Um, w w do you know whether these tools are, you know, you mentioned the last night, elections in Nigeria and frontline SMS being used there. What role do you think these tools are going to play in the context of the next national elections? I think they'll play a much greater role than they did in 2007 because people are much more aware of the technologies that are available. And as I mentioned um, recently in Anambra State, they were used there and to a lesser extent in another state in the West. And already um, civil society and um, pro-democracy movements have started to put things together in place to monitor the pre-election period and the election period using these various technologies. 
And um, you also, I, I thought that was a really important point. Um, you pointed out that um, the technology itself is basically, it, it's ambivalent. There are uses of it for hate, and there are uses of it for peace. Um, yeah, it, what has your been, experience been um, in, in, the, in those different lines? Like, how have you witnessed those developments taking place? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the first was, was part of, um, w would have been picked up by you, Shahidi. It was in the post-election, Kenya post-election in 2008, when um, messages of hate were being spread <clears throat> in Kenya, and in that instance, the, the, um, the president, I think, had asked the Safaricom to close down the network, and they had said, no, we're not going to close it down, but what we'll do is we'll send out countering messages, and that's what happened. Um, recently in Nigeria, we've had two really um, horrible incidences. We've had riots, which I'll just make it simple, but it's not that simple, which are between religious, religious ethnic riots in the Middle Belt in an area called Jos. And um, over 100 SMS messages were identified spreading hate and, campaign and mobilizing people to commit um, hate crimes. And then um, more recently, in Lagos and the surrounding areas, <laughs> A message was being messages were being circulated, which were supposedly from NASA, saying that there is going to be acid rain falling between two particular days in Lagos and the environs. But the thing is that, I know it sounds funny, but people went into panic, and the messages also said that you would get skin cancer if you were out at this time. Um, so it caused a lot of chaos and so on. And then in, there was a similar one in Ghana, where they put out messages saying that there was going to be an earthquake. This was following the Haiti earthquake, and loads of people again went into panic, and many people slept out, outdoors. So I do think that it's a huge challenge, and something that doesn't bode well for the forthcoming elections in Nigeria anyway, and possibly in other countries. And so that's a challenge for the mobile service providers and the government to, I mean, like with the acid rain, the, the service providers could have just sent out a message saying, look, this is a hoax. Yeah, like Safari. Yeah, exactly. Like positive exactly. Note out and, yeah. and utilize the fact that these are like multi-directional mm. and not just yeah, one, one direction. way. Yeah, right. but they didn't, and the, the, the government hasn't prosecuted anybody or taken it up. So I think that's one of the challenges that civil society has to take on board to put the pressurize the government and the service right. providers. Yeah. Are there questions? Do you guys have questions? I have loads more, but do you have some? There's a question there. Do you want to? Microphone. You can... Thank you for walking all that way. My question is exactly in these instances where there are hoax messages going out, where there might be um, some misunderstanding, what kind of education or awareness programs do you have to get out there and explain to the users um, how these technologies function, how uh, journalism functions, that we don't always accept everything that we get, every message we get? What types of education uh, do you do in that, in that regards to increase awareness among the public? You mean what kind of education is in place at the moment? To train, to train uh, the awareness process among the users, among the people who are um, uh, utilizing this, uh, these resources. Oh, I see. Not none as far as I know, but I, I, I mean, I think that the natural awareness is that you know when you're sending out a message to mobilize to go and kill people, that you know that that's wrong. So, um, but more on the I don't understand. Do Sorry, like, more oh, on the recipient I... end. That's what I mean. Sorry? Sorry, can you say again? More on the recipient end. There's a lot of... Uh, like, uh, do you mean, uh, like, are there NGOs doing media training or are there any pro programs supporting media training taking place or is that something that really still needs to happen? No, there, there isn't anything. I mean, these, the incidents I mentioned all, have all happened since February, since February this year. So it's a fairly new, new thing that is taking place. But I, as I said, I think civil society 
and pro-democracy movements are going to take those challenges on board, having seen what happened in Jos, uh, which was pretty horrendous, and hundreds and hundreds of people were killed, including a lot of children. So I think they will take it on board, yeah. I want to slip in a question there, speaking of like, you know, engagement of civil society groups and how to, uh, um, yeah, further promote media education. Um, Last year we spoke about, um, when we spoke last year, <laughs> you told me that there was an increasing awareness on the governmental side for critical bloggers, especially in Nigeria, whereas in other countries the government hasn't really caught on that that is a critical voice speaking out. In, in Nigeria there was a growing awareness and there were also more and more campaigns from the governmental side to silence those critical bloggers' voices. I wanted to ask you if you have any updates on those developments and whether um, on the other side, like the citizens' campaigns that you were showing me, whether that has grown to uh, counter any, any repression from the governmental side? Um, yeah, the last year, it was reported by um, an, organ an online news site called Sahara Reporters that keeps us all in Nigeria on our toes. Um, they reported that the government had recruited 700 people um, paid um, uh, paid 700 people to blog positively about Nigeria to counter some of the criticism coming from political bloggers in the country and, in, and, and also in the diaspora. Well, it's pretty easy to know who these people are because they, they will leave comments that are very positive for the government and, but uh, I haven't actually noticed any particular blog but I have noticed quite a lot of people making comments on blogs, so I'm not really sure how true. We live on rumors in Nigeria. It's one of our favorite pastimes, and we love it. And um, so whether this was true or not, I don't know. But I would say that the blogosphere in Nigeria over the last 12 months has really, really changed. And there are far more political bloggers. People are being far more critical, and people, the bloggers are, are, are working together. And also the, um, the online news media, the traditional um, uh, print news media, has all, have also come online, and they've also kind of changed their design to, to incorporate comments, and Twitter, and Facebook, and so on. So there's much more interaction going on between the mainstream media, the bloggers, um, Twitterers, and so on. So there has been a huge, huge movement um, from in the Nigerian political blogosphere, yeah. I think we have time for one, possibly two more questions. Are there any more questions from the audience? We are all part, yes, okay. <laughs> There's one up there. I have a question concerning the uh, Ushahidi project. Uh, I was wondering, uh, how do people know, in, or did people know in Haiti, uh, sort of crawling about the rubble, uh, how do people know of the Ushahidi, local Ushahidi telephone number? And uh, the second question is, now, how effective is your, uh, is your map, is your map of uh, uh, the occurrences, and uh, in what way did it help people and the emergency teams? Thank you. Okay. Uh, the first question is on the number, the telephone number. Uh, we obviously, uh, it's not Ushahidi that will set up your software. It's like, let me give you an analogy, uh, a comparison with uh, Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft will never come to your office to set up your office suite or any software of theirs. But of course, we provide the uh, services to that. Um, it can be any number. And uh, we usually use frontline SMS and ClickRTL, uh, which are quite robust and very easy to set up. Um, obviously, the numbers are propagated within the Haiti community. You, if you're so far, like you're in Germany or the States, it will be quite some time before you actually get the number to you. And um, there are very many crises all over the world that probably use Ushahidi. 
and I'm one person, I can't know every number. So I don't know the Haiti number. Uh, the second question, what was it? Uh, How effective has it been? Like, what, can, you, can you say what the effect was of using Shahidi in Haiti? Okay. Well, I'll give you my own personal thought about it, but I prefer to, uh, to fire that back with uh, what we see in the media. Uh, the Times, the New York Times has probably reported that Ushahidi is quite effective in... Uh, uh, I earlier mentioned that families want to know what's happening to their loved ones uh, in a crisis area. And Ushahidi has been quite good with that. Um, uh, if the maps aren't right, blame Google. But otherwise, the information is quite accurate. Uh, we usually map where the, uh, the locations of the text message. Uh, probably, I think I read of some reports that guys in the rubble or underground were texting. Yeah, they needed help, they needed to get out where are people and all that. And um, I mentioned earlier that uh, such information tends to be mammoth, quite large. And uh, that's why we are working on an NLP system that will easily spot things human beings could miss out. Yeah. So the accuracy and the efficiency is only as effective as the human being reading the reports and all that. Yeah. I can't say it's 100% effective, but it's quite efficient. I think that's an important point, like the first point um, that was just uh, asked for and made now that Ushahidi is a platform and people can use it for many, many different causes, just as you won't be the one user of Swift River, but you're offering it as a platform for different users around the world. I think that's about all we have time for today. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and hope that those of you who are interested in these topics will have time and space to join us during the workshops tomorrow. And I hope that we get back here next year and hear of lots of interesting uh, ways that Swift River has been deployed around the world. So thanks very much to you both and to all of you.